All right, let's look at this next example. We're going to sketch the graph of f of x equals x squared e to the x. Let's just go ahead and work out a few things. We've got the domain. What's the domain of this? Well, we can plug any x value in, and the function makes perfect sense at any of those values. So the domain is all real numbers. Do we have any intercepts? Well, let's look at the x-intercepts. So the x-intercepts are where the function is 0. So where is f of x equal to 0? In other words, where is x squared e to the x equal to 0? Well, the exponential function is never 0. The only place this product can be 0 is when x squared is 0. And that means it's going to be when x is 0. OK, and that just means, well, we know what our y-intercepts are, because our y-intercepts are the places where x is 0. And therefore, we have a y-intercept happening at the origin as well. So the only place where our graph hits either the x or the y-axis is right at the origin, and it hits both of them there. Is there any symmetry to this? Well, it's, there's no odd or even symmetry because, well, we've got an x squared here, but we've got an x in the exponent, so there's sort of a mix of odd and even powers of x, so it doesn't look like there's any odd or even symmetry. No periodic symmetry either. So we have no symmetry to worry about here. How about asymptotes? So do we have any horizontal asymptotes? So we get our horizontal asymptotes by looking at our end behavior. What's going on as we head off towards infinity of x squared e to the x? Well, as we head off towards infinity, x squared blows up, e to the x blows up as well. The product of them, well, that even blows up a lot more. So this is heading off to infinity. What about as we head off towards negative infinity of x squared e to the x? Well, as we head towards negative infinity, x squared heads off to infinity, but e to the x heads to 0. Ah, so we've got a battle going on here. x squared is getting big, e to the x is getting small, small closer to 0. What's the product doing? Is it getting big? Is it getting small? Is it going something in between? So we're going to have to do a little bit more work here. So x squared is getting big. I'm going to leave that up top. I'm going to rewrite this expression by bringing e downstairs as the e to the negative x. And now I notice that this is of type what? Well, the top's going to infinity. The bottom, e to the, x, e to the negative x, as x goes to negative infinity, that goes to infinity as well. So this is of type infinity over infinity. Ah, so this is perfect. We know how to deal with these. We can use L'Hopital's rule. So what does L'Hopital tell us to do? Well, it says you can work out the value of this limit by working out the value of another limit, the limit of the ratio of the two derivatives. They happen to have the same limits. So take the derivative of the top, put it over the derivative of the bottom. Now as x goes to negative infinity, the top's going to negative infinity, the bottom's going to negative infinity, so this is of type infinity over infinity again. So we can use L'Hopital again. And notice that each step of L'Hopital is dropping the power in the top by 1. So we know that we don't have to continue doing this forever. This next application will get us into a form where we can deal with it. Derivative of the top is 2. Derivative of the bottom is back to e to the negative x. What happens as x goes to negative infinity? Well, the top goes to 2. The bottom goes to infinity. So the ratio 2 over infinity is heading towards 0. So we have a horizontal asymptote. Uh, y equals 0 is a horizontal asymptote. Do we have any vertical asymptotes? Well, no, there's, the domain was all real numbers. It makes sense to plug every, all values in. There's going to be no place where it's blowing up. So we've dealt with those. What about our intervals of increase and decrease? Now we start to apply our methods from calculus. Where is it increasing? Where is it decreasing? Those are going to be the places where the derivative is positive or negative. So let's go ahead and work out its derivative. The derivative of this is a product. So the derivative is the derivative of the first, 2x, times the second, e to the x, plus the first, which is x squared, times the derivative of the second, which is e to the x. And that can factor as x 
times 2 plus x times e to the x. What's our critical numbers? Critical numbers are places where the derivative is 0 or doesn't exist, and we see that the derivative is 0 when x is 0 or when x is negative 2. So let's go ahead and draw our number line. 0 and oh, negative 2 is over here. Negative 2. What is our derivative's sign on these intervals? So you can plug in test points. One of the ways I like to look at things like this is to say, well, what's in front of the e to the x? Notice the e to the x is always positive. So what's in front is really going to determine the sign. And what's in front is 2 plus x times x. That's a quadratic with a positive coefficient in front of the leading term, the positive coefficient being 1. So I know a quadratic with a positive leading term, leading coefficient, opens upwards. It's going to have two roots. If it has any roots, it'll have two of them. We found the two roots already. So it's got to be opening up like this. So it's got to be positive, negative, positive. And therefore, f is increasing, decreasing, increasing. So we've got our intervals of increase and decrease. And we have a local max at negative 2 and a local min at 0. And so what are the values? When well, we plug 0 into our original function, x squared e to the x, we get 0. You plug negative 2 in, x squared, that would be 4 in this case, e to the negative 2. So there's our local extrema. What about concavity? Well, now again, we have to do the same thing with our second derivative. So we'll go back to our first derivative, and then we can go ahead and compute our second derivative. And our second derivative turns out to be x squared plus 4x plus 2e to the x. So where is our second derivative equal to 0? Well, that's where this quadratic in front is equal to 0. So we can use the quadratic formula on that. It's negative 4 plus or minus the square root of b squared, which is 16, minus 4 times a times c, which is 2, all over 2 times a, which is just 2. And so this becomes a negative 4 plus or minus the square root of 8 over 2, or negative 2 plus or minus root 2. So we've got a negative 2 minus root 2 and a negative 2 plus root 2 as our values where our second derivative is 0. What is the sign of our second derivative then? Well again that's a quadratic in front of e to the x. Quadratic with positive coefficient in front of the x squared term so it's going to be opening upwards so I know it has to go positive, negative, positive. Note if you didn't see that, that's fine. You can still plug in test values in each of these intervals and see that the signs are just as I've indicated here. So f is concave up, concave down, concave up. Now, one of the things we're going to have to do is piece the information about increase and decrease and this information about concavity together. So I need to know where these negative 2 plus root 2 and negative 2 minus root 2 sit on the number line. So where do these things sit? Well, I just need rough approximations. So root 2 is about 1.4. So I'm going to use that. I'm going to say, well, root 2 is about 1.4. So this is roughly negative 3.4. And it's also roughly, using the plus now, negative 2 plus something that's about 1.4 means it's about negative 0.6. So we're just to the left of 3 and just to the left of 0. So those are where my numbers are roughly sitting. Notice I have inflection points here. I'll just indicate them like this. I've got concave up to concave down. So that's an inflection point. And then it goes from concave down to concave up. So these are both inflection points. OK. So let's go ahead and sketch all of this on our graph now. So here's our graph. 
maybe I'll scroll up for just one second, our function x squared e to the x. I know x squared e to the x, both positive, everything's positive, so it's always sitting above the x-axis, so when I draw my horizontal axes in here, I can keep it nice and low on my vertical axes, because I know my function's not going to dip below. I know it passes through this point, 0, 0, that was my x and y intercept. What else do I know? Let's go through our list here. I know that there was a horizontal asymptote of zero and we approached it as we went to negative infinity. So I know it's going to be coming down to zero as I head off to negative infinity. So it's going to be heading down here, like this. To negative, as we go off to negative infinity, it's going to zero. Then I know that as I move in this direction, as I move to the right, the function's increasing until I hit negative 2, where I hit a local max, and then it decreases down to 0. So I've got to have a local max here, whose value is 4e to the negative 2, which is occurring at negative 2. And I know there's some things going on with these inflection points that live on either side of negative 2. They both live equally on <laughs> equal distance on either side. One is root 2 to the left and then one is also root 2 to the right. So we're over here and over here. So that's negative 2 minus root 2. Scroll up just a little bit here. And negative 2 root. Negative 2 plus root 2. And so those are our inflection points. We can plug these values into our function, get rough um, we can get exact values or we can get rough values. Uh, helps to get a rough decimal approximation for those values, perhaps. Um, if you want to see where they sit, they roughly sit something like here and here. The point is, is that our function has to come up. Notice it's concave up, so it's concave up until we hit this point here. And then it switches to concave down. So now I'm concave down. So concave down. Concave up. Maybe I'll really put the emphasis on this here, just so we can see it. Concave up, and then we hit that inflection point here. Switch to concave down. Then we're concave down until we hit that point, and then we switch to concave up. And then once we're concave up, we're concave up forever and increasing forever, so it looks like that. And there is the graph of our function. We've got the maximum value, we've indicated the points where the concavity switches, and we've got the overall shape. So let's go ahead and use a graphing utility to plot this as well. So I've typed in f of x is equal to our function, let's hit enter, and there is our graph, and we can move it around a little bit. I'm going to squeeze the axes a little bit to get our overall shape. That looks pretty much like the thing we've got. We see that there is a maximum here at negative 2. We worked out its value already. We discovered that. There's also, it's apparent that it's concave up here. And then at some point around here, it switches to concave down. And then at some point, again, it switches to concave up. We found those exact values where the concavity switches. They were negative 2 plus or minus the square root of 2. So they were square root of 2 on either side of that place where the maximum occurs. Alright, so that's it for this example.